Greetings and welcome to Vassals of Kingsgrave. This is the first installment of what we're calling A Seminar of Ice and Fire, a series where we'll take turns re-examining A Song of Ice and Fire novels from different academic or theoretical perspectives in hopes of gaining some new insights into the text. Each episode will take one critical reading as our jumping off point for discussion of a specific aspect of the world of Westeros. Today we're starting with some selections from Emile Durkheim's Elementary Forms of Religious Life, and we'll be talking in particular about the forms and role of totemism in A Song of Ice and Fire. If you'd like to play along at home, a link to those selections will be included in the episode notes so you can take a look, and I encourage you to add anything you think we may have overlooked or um, something else that occurred to you in the comments either on the forum or on YouTube um, or Facebook or any of the other great places you can find Vox. So all of that said, I am your host today, uh, Sarah, Dr. Blood on the forums, and I am joined by Adam. Hey, this is Adam uh, Drum Snow on the forums. And Wilson. Hello, this is Wilson, uh, Wandering Prophet on the forums. So just before we get started with the actual discussion, I did want to make a little bit of a Vox disclaimer. Um, Durkheim's Elementary Forms of Religion is a classic work of sociological or anthropological theory. It was published in 1912. So the author's views on religion, beliefs, and culture do not necessarily reflect those of the host today or of Vox in general. Uh, Durkheim's overall argument in this work is that religion fundamentally is fundamentally social in origin, a product of the collective experience of a group. Today, we're going to focus specifically on Durkheim's descriptions of totemism, first the clan totem and then the individual. Um, and I think it's safe to say that both of these categories have important applications to A Song of Ice and Fire, but um, I would like to hear what you guys think about it. Um, I think we should start with the idea of the group totem and its possible applications to the series. Um, Durkheim defines the group totem as the use of a particular symbol, usually animal, but occasionally a plant or an object, to designate a clan's collective identity. The symbol is unique to a given clan, and to share the totem is to share rights, qualities, and bonds of kinship with other members of that clan. In some cases, the clan even claims direct descent from their totemic creature, whom they regard as an ancestor. So what do you guys think about um, the idea of group totems in Song of Ice and Fire? Well, I mean, it's definitely there. Um, the, the, the articles you posted, I found very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously, George's world is not quite, you know, parallel with ours. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's like modern day. We have kind of these things have evolved, right, mm -hmm. over times. But heraldry and, you know, sigils and all that are, are heavily rooted in, I think, part, a big reason why um, A Song of Ice and Fire is so popular, number one, is because... I mean, even as the reader, a lot of people will kind of identify with a particular, you know, clan or, or whatnot. Yeah, I, uh, your definitions were super helpful for a non-sociologist. Um, it's not my field at all. So on the base, like uh, in the simplest of terms, um, you can see the idea in current um, ethnic groups um around the world, but in um, The Song of Ice and Fire, I think the definitions are not as um, exact, or maybe the consequences is not are not as um, evident in everyday life of the characters, for example. Um, the, the great lords and those who often refer to their uh, sigils when they're, you know, in conversation or in arguments, um, those are there, like, you know, the Lannisters will always call themselves lions or, um, you know, Tywin's loyalty seems uh, to be expressed with your lion of the rock. So, you know, I have to look after you or, or whatnot. But, um, you know, as far as your everyday people in Westeros, um, you know, there there's some liberty, liberty I think, with um, what Mr. George R. R. Martin has done. Um, but there, there, there are some aspects uh, that I'm sure as we as we delve into, we will um, we will we will find those similarities striking or very evident. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree um, that these 
these themes are at work in here, I wouldn't have suggested. <laughs> um, but I, I do, I mean, I think it's important probably to make the distinction between suggesting that, um, that either George deliberately built in or that we can see evidence that these are sort of fully developed socio-religious systems. Um, but I, you know, my idea in, in looking at this particular text was more to just kind of get us really thinking about the way that these self-identifications work um, in the text and the way that um, they, they work differently between um, the different clans or the different houses um, and the people that are loyal to them. So one of the, one of the ways that I was thinking about it um, when I was sitting down to, to kind of parse this out is um, the question of whether the sigil or any other kind of identifying characteristic or mark for a group um, and, and I think our minds tend to go towards sigils, but I think there are some other um, potentially interesting examples um, outside of Westeros as well. But the question of whether that that animal signifier, that emblem signifier is something like a brand where it's the way that someone or right. a group is deliberately crafting themselves or crafting an image for themselves, um, or whether it's the way that they self-identify or whether either they regard it or others regard it or even the text regards it as potentially even like genetic, right? Like intrinsic to their actual biology. Um, and I think for, for some of our groups that brand identity biology division is, is much sharper. And then for some of them, it's, um, it's pretty fuzzy. It's like for the Targaryens, I would suggest that it's almost like uncomfortably fuzzy in some places. Precisely. So, yeah. Yeah. It's the one that jumps out at you, mm -hmm. the target indeed. Um, yeah. Um, question for you. I, I know we're talking about the clan totems, but to what degree are we trying to understand whether or not the symbol represents the people or the people are trying to emulate whatever the symbol just, um, signifies or means? Um, I mean, I think that's a really great question. I think, and we're speaking first in terms of the collective totem. Um, one of the things that Durkheim suggests is that the totem animal or the totem symbol becomes so important because it is invested with all of the collective power and the collective expectations and the collective pressures of the group that it identifies. So um, the banner becomes, just as an example, becomes uh, um, invested with the authority not just of the kind of ruling lord represented by that banner, but just like the collective identity of all of the banner men and then also the the um, continuity through time, right? So I think if you're, it is something that you're trying to live up to, but it's also something that is a collective identity in a very inescapable sense, right? So I guess it's a little bit of both um, that there's a there's a sense in which the, the thing the totem represents and then by extension the totem itself has its own expectations of you um so and i i think tywin right. is a great example of that where he's like that's not that's not what a lion does that's not how a lion acts right but it's it's as much pressure from like the history of the lannisters as it is from his own understanding of and you would think that um the original you know sigils they picked were maybe emblematic of whoever started the house, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So it's possible that it's, it, that it was a characteristic of the area or of the house at the time or something that they either aspired to or saw, or, you know, people get nicknames and they're, well, that's, you know, that's going to be my, you know, my sigil. And then of course, once it's as ingrained as it is like, you know, the dire wolves and the lions and for hundreds of years, you know, or more of history, um, then I think that you, you do get a situation where, yeah, the people and the, the families themselves also start to kind of live up to that. You know, like, oh, yeah, well, you, know, we're, you know, we're wolves. The wolves, you know, you know, hunt in a pack. The, you know, a lion doesn't, you know, take shit from anyone, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, and it's mostly, I mean, obviously, they're, you know, pick and choose, like, in wartime, you know, if your symbol is, like, the badgers or something, you'd be like, <laughs> oh, the, the badger can dig in and get through this battle. <laughs> right. You'd find... <laughs> You'd find a way to rally your men, you know, using whatever is most convenient for you. But uh, it, it definitely does seem that, uh, especially like a certain amount of the small folk, really identify um, in in a way that's you know interesting. I think the the more fairly they are treated, 
by their lords, the more they kind of tend to identify, I think. Oh, that's interesting. It, it, it very much so. And, and your clarification now and earlier, um, Sarah, when you mentioned how much the totem demands of you as your character, you know, to live up to that, um, to the symbol itself, or whatever it means for you. Um, I thought of the Krakens, for example, where mm-hmm. there is an actual dilemma with Theon, who is trying to live up to everything that he's supposed to be, um, even though he did not grow up with I mean, I forget how young he was when he was taken away, but um, that identity conflict with him really does uh, play out very literally when he has to make a decision between which of his families to support. And the conflict is in, well, I must be who I'm supposed to be, you know, the Kraken, and this is what they're doing. Um, And, you know, it even goes beyond sense where he needs to retreat. But I think uh, we hear in the books, I don't know if it's his father or whoever makes the comment that whatever the Kraken grasps, it never lets go. Um, and and Theon really holds on to the idea that he must capture this and he must be a Kraken. And, and we know how that ends up for him. Meanwhile, um, someone like Yara, for example, not Yara, sorry, Asha, his sister, who, you know, is a Kraken and has her thing, but she's not bound, you know, totally by these. I, she doesn't seem more... Um, more, I don't know, attached to the symbol or or to what is expected of her. She seems to be walking her own path. So she's able to make decisions and not blindly follow the expectations of all her people. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's interesting to think of it that way. But until, you, you know, you brought up this topic about totemism, which I've never heard of until now, um, it, you know, it's, it's uh, it's more of a mystery um, as to why certain characters um, make these decisions um, that have these consequences that are very very severe. And I'm thinking in in Theon's case, where he literally makes a decision to betray the family that he does kind of care about and love, mm-hmm. um, as we learn later, simply because he's trying to live up to what a kraken is supposed to be. Yeah, I I think that's that's very profound as, as far as Theon is concerned. And I think it's interesting too, that linguistically in the book, he's identified so much more often as Greyjoy than he is as a Kraken. Whereas the Starks right. as wolves are, are so interchangeable. Um, and I, I think it's particularly interesting from the, the animistic standpoint or from the totemic standpoint that um, our first introduction to Theon is in that chapter where the Stark kids find the dire wolves and he's just there being like, yeah, we should kill him. You know, and he, he, he has no connection to yeah. the animals. He has no connection. He doesn't right. get a puppy. You know, he he's just kind of, it's a big joke to him. And um, Ooh, what if there was an extra dire wolf? <gasps> what, if, what if there had oh. been a Theon dire wolf? Well, that's, that's an interesting what if. Anyway, yeah. sorry. Yeah, no, that would have been, I think that would have been a, a game changer for him because it would have been kind of the same way that it was for John. Like it, it, it would have been, you know, a, a tacit confirmation that, Right, he like yeah, John. John rationalizes and says, "Well, there's just enough for your sons, mm-hmm. uh, or for your for your children, because he didn't because he, he counted and was like, well, I, I don't count.' And then as soon as they find one, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, there's one for me too. Like, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I like I like Michael's idea that they would find a a squid, like the coldest squid, squid in the. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I mean Theon's always been uh, one of the more interesting characters in the series to me, and especially because of the pull between the two houses, you know, mm-hmm. the, the ironborn, the, the, you know, his adopted family of the North. But I think just the, the, the stark relation between the dire wolves and the Greyjoys with their uh, Krakens is very different because mm-hmm. in a lot of the texts, the ironborn, number one, they have their own religion, which I mean, so do, you know, the men of the North kind of, um, it's not as well defined as either the seven or the, um, the drowned gods, I guess, like they're not as like stringent about that stuff. But the Kraken is not something that like has a lot of positive characteristics that a human being would want to associate. Like, yeah, you know, Kraken is going to win this battle. Like the Kraken is a scary monster Mm -hmm. that lives in the deep and you can't breathe down there. Right. Like humans don't exist there. And their religion is built on like to drown is good. So if if the Kraken, you know, swallows you and brings you to the drowned gods, watery halls, like that's a good thing for you. Which obviously, you know, would have uh, developed out of, you know, a culture that many people died at sea because they were, uh, you know, 
you know, a fishing culture, a seafaring culture. So they find a way to kind of take the sting away from that. Mm-hmm. But I think that's maybe why the, they're not referred to as Krakens as much as they are Greyjoys, typically, because it's maybe a little harder to identify when they're not, like, on the, when they're on the water, I think. They, they tend to talk more about, like, the, the Kraken. Yeah, and I, I mean, that may be one of Victorian's shortcomings. Um, and I, I think in, in, my, in my rereading, I've become a little bit more fond of Victorian than I was in the initial. But, I mean, he has the Kraken helm, and he wears the Kraken cl- You know, I mean, he's, he's very on brand in a way that I feel like um, I feel like some of the other people aren't. He's that, he's that Raiders fan at the game that's dressed as Darth <laughs> Vader with spikes right. coming out of it. Like, yeah. that's, that's he's, the, he's the guy with no shirt on in Minnesota who's painted, you know. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, but I mean, for him, like, that, that may be a good example of that kind of permeability between the difference of, of brand versus identity, right? Where if, um, if the Greyjoys chose the Kraken, as you guys are suggesting, not because they wanted to um, affiliate with it or, or be, you know, sort of ancestrally related to it but because they wanted other people to think of them as this kind of scary grasping sea creature um then maybe victorian is is tending towards like over identifying with what initially had been a a very you know sort of targeted branding especially because of his his insecurities and his his trauma and stuff Mm -hmm. um would would you know it would be very easy to want to identify to something yeah. That is kind of the like old, you know. There's there's no predator for a kraken, right? Like it is, it's the apex predator of the ocean. That's true. Yeah, that's a very good point. I, I mean, I think I think that idea of you know what you want your sigil to do, or your totem to do, for your group versus what you want it to do to other groups, is a very interesting like psychologically or um, is a very interesting distinction and it's one that um i was thinking a lot about with the flayed man because as far as i can tell or as far as i could think of they're the only ones who well first of all it's not it's not an animal or a plant which is pretty unusual but it's also like basically an an advertisement for what they'll do to you rather than who they are right right (laughs) <laughs> like, I mean, I don't, I don't think, I don't think Bruce Bolton like self identifies well, unless the bolt on theory is correct, but I don't think he self identifies as a flayed man. As a flayed man. Right? <laughs> <laughs> We're is, the flayed men, like, oh. Which is weird because no. then again, their cloaks are like bloody and pink. So arguably they could be. Right. So he, like. he, try, he tries to kind of like, you know, he always wants it to be in, in people's minds. That yeah. like you know flaying people, but then he always downplays like we don't do that anymore. That's so silly. I don't even know why that's a symbol, you know. Yeah. But he also like has these little hints to kind of make sure that you don't forget. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's a weird. It's a weird one because it is. I mean, it's a very. It's very outwardly directed. I feel like whereas a lot of the other ones are very, um, very inwardly significant to the the members that follow it. Then you get people like Ramsey, so I guess maybe it's not the best strategy. But <laughs> it's very effective if it, if the idea is to drive uh, fear into the hearts of your opponents, it's super effective. Probably the most effective, if I may say. Yeah. Right, because almost every other sigil, like whether it's you know like the rose or you know it's sun spear, um, even like you have the you know the giants of umber and monsters and all this stuff none of none of the people can actually um none of that can come to pass like that can't materialize right Mm -hmm. like the the except for the starks find some direwolves i guess but like generally speaking you're not going to be facing the lannisters and their like lion cavalry you know when when you're going up against the boltons and they're like this is what we do to people that die that you know betray us or that go up against us we you know shave your skin off like that's kind of like uh yeah that's pretty horrific well it's now i'm thinking i I was saying they don't identify as as flayed men but then i'm thinking about the suit of armor that theon wears when he comes and takes over winterfell like when he leaves as reek and comes back as theon i mean sorry not as um theon as ramsey um he's wearing armor and the helmet is the face of a man screaming so he he actually is sculpted as the man who's being oh, flayed. Is it? Yeah, which is super weird. Uh, um, yeah, 
Jeez, yeah, imagine great. the armor that had to make that. <laughs> right, right. You get the specifications. It's it's crazy. When he goes in, I was like, I want the face to look kind of like this, and he's like, um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, question for you then. Just make a uh, nine hound, uh, hound, nice uh, hound's helmet. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. those were the days. <laughs> yeah, those were. Um, I forgot the question I had in mind, but here we go. All right. Um, I wonder how much, so can we define or look at how much symbols unite a clan as opposed to, um, well, not as opposed to, but how, how well... Um, or to what degree any of the symbols in Westeros unifies the clan or the people that are under it. So, for example, the lions, uh, Tywin is always, or at least um, he emphasizes the need to be together as a family because that's what, you know, makes them strong. And it's one reputation that binds them all. So when, when Tyrion gets taken away, for example, it's not an attack on Tyrion Lannister, it's an attack on the entire Lannisters, right? Mm -hmm. um, would that be an example of how a symbol or how a totem is an effective symbol for uniting a clan? I, I think so, yeah. I mean, I think to, to extend um, Tywin's very emphatic use of the lion as a as a an emblem of control i think and sort of direction of behavior and things like that um would be all the lion crested helmets that all of the red cloaks wear right so that and that his rondals on his armor are lions like he he uses it very um it's very showy the way that the lion is used in ways that like i don't think i know the starks yeah. have the, the sigils embroidered but i don't think they wear you know snarling wolf helms and i don't think that, i mean they're from the north right so there's a different culture there too but um but they are i mean you know it is it is i think for him very much both a brand and an identity so i think only lannisters of the rock are expected or allowed to self-identify as lions but that it like durkheim talks about um using the totem as a mark of property and i i think that Tywin is a great example of the way that like anything that has a lion on it belongs to Tywin Lannister um, and the lions. Right. And, like... and yeah. I mean, like you said, it's, it's used sometimes as a, like kind of a dehumanizing or a, a way to detach from you know, the things that you're doing and the things that, you know, the armies do. So to say, you know, well, we've got to, you know, we've got to burn these villages and we've got to, you know, steal these crops and kill these people. Cause you know, the lion doesn't take no shit. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's a way to kind of push that, um, but at the same time, it is, yeah, it, it also can, can mark your properties, like, you know, um, you know, just wear, just wearing those symbols around, you know, you, it's, you know, obviously, you know, like, you know, gang paraphernalia or anything like that. It's all, it's all kind of the same, the same thing, you, you yeah. know, that you're, you're, you're part of this crew, you're part of this group. And especially if you're winning, it works out really well. Um, but yeah. I like, like, you know, you don't see the Baratheons soldiers running into battle with, you know, s horns coming out of their helmets. You know, deer. Yeah. 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 Oh, that, so, that I mean, like, another... some, some of them are obviously cooler than others. But... Like the Baratheon thing I thought was really interesting in this, in this regard, too, because it's one of the, um, don't we hear in, in uh, Fire and Blood how they got the sigil, right? Like, they basically appropriated it from the previous storm lords and i'm blanking on his name right now but uh, the durandon um and he uh, he takes it like the baratheon uh, takes it so it's it starts out as like yeah. not his sigil so maybe the baratheons and it's also a lot more recent than some of the other ones so like i wonder if they're less attached to it but it really struck me um again in the context of this particular reading that the reason um robert leaves the the castle when he is ultimately gored by the boar is to go hunt a stag. And I'm like, well, that seems really not <laughs> appropriate, right? Like they, he's got this huge like stag hunt going. And, um, you know, given the fact that at least other people identify the stag as very closely with him, like when they find the antler and the dire wolf, everybody's very like uncomfortable with that. 
um, the idea that yeah right. he, he would be going out to hunt his own sigil just seems very yeah like as Michael says but like, don't the Tullys eat lots of trout no <laughs> Yeah, like don't they fish a ton? So I don't know. I mean, I mean they, their sigil their sigil just sucks, so they just kind of try to like pretend that like they don't have one. Yeah. But still. Yeah, that's a great like they it's it's sort of neither brand nor identity nor biology. Like nobody says themselves like let's do what the trouts would do, but also yeah. it's not that scary. And also, I'm pretty sure they don't believe that they're part trout you know what i mean so like what the yeah, hell were they thinking uh, when they, I think so. they the, <laughs> the association is not as strong for the tullys as it is for the uh for the lannisters with the lions i agree yeah uh i i think there is and if we're uh there is a a, a passage and correct me please where cersei gets a report from kyburn about a puppet show <gasps> with lions and dragons and like people die over that little yeah. thing mm -hmm. um and if we can jump into the duncan egg stories where um what's his name arian the yes. bright prince yeah, yeah does the he i mean he he crushes her thumb over a puppet show um and it, you know these things might seem like just acts of cruelty but they have like real consequences um i don't know if it's an individual thing where you know, we have these characters who behave in these ways because for them, their identity is very much tied to, um, maybe not in Cersei's case, but their identity is very much tied to these symbols. And it's not just a symbol, it's who they are, it's their power and influence and any comment on these symbols or these things, um, you know, could translate into an attack on them or their house. And so they feel like they have to respond. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's absolutely, it really speaks to the the internalization of these emblems and what they stand for. And um, as far as like the the first person narratives or the kind of internal perspectives, the point of views that we get, um, I noticed that Arya and... Cersei and Danny, at least these are the ones that jumped out at me, are the are the ones who most consistently say, I am a this, right? Like I am a lion, I am a wolf, versus yeah. like I'm the young wolf, or I'm the sleepy lion, or I'm the young lion, or I'm the you know, I mean like there are there are clearly instances where people take it as their their moniker or like their sobriquet, but these guys it's it's a lowercase like i am actually one of these animals um mm. and it's yeah. it's a very interesting like and it and it it seeps into the way that Cersei thinks about tywin too where she says like this is not how a lion should die this is not how a lion should look it's not it's not a, a lion of lannister it's just like the actual animal um and it's a it's an interesting it's a really interesting slippage that happens um like I said, at least very noticeably with those three, um, those three particular points of view. Um, whereas, uh, John, for example, I don't think ever thinks of himself as a wolf. He's just BFFs with ghosts, which is something we can talk about with the yeah. individual. Um, you know what I mean? But he's not like, John a wolf has a hard too. time thinking like, of himself as a crow. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, that's true. Yeah. yeah he, he's, He's John's confused. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he has good reasons to be he confused. Has the issues, yeah. Um, your list, uh, Sarah, was that Arya, Sansa, and Cersei, or um, Arya, that... Cersei, and Danny? Danny, okay, not mm -hmm. Sansa. Sorry. No. Thank you. Okay. No, I was sorry. going to suggest Danny. I wonder if, because uh, I'm trying to recall in the books where they make these statements of, you know, I'm a dragon, I'm a, I'm a lion. It almost sounds like they're trying to reassure themselves in their circumstance so Arya says i'm a wolf a lot when she feels threatened or lost um mm -hmm. like when she goes to bravos and you know she has to really think about what she needs to do next and she's overcome with fear and she reminds herself she's I'm starting a wolf. to forget who she is mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's, um, a, yeah that's a really good and and seriously it's when we when she's theoretically in power but she we see her you know sort of succumbing to paranoia Cersei, yeah turn. it's whenever she feels like she needs to command the power she's like you know she, she's her own hype man she's like you're a lion 
You're mm-hmm. lying. She's like looking in the mirror like, <laughs> yeah. smacking yeah. herself in the face. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. I, I wish we had gotten a, a first person view or like a, from Tywin's point of view, I wish we had had a Tywin chapter just to see how he thinks of himself in his mind and how he comes up, uh, if he has any conflict, first of all, in his thinking, because he seems so oh, resolute yeah, in just, everything he does. Yeah. But does he tell himself... Tywin POV mind? would be so great. That would, that would be really interesting. Like, yeah. I'm a lion of the rock, you know? Maybe he does have to reassure himself. Or is he just like, I can't shit gold? <laughs> what? <laughs> Actually, I'm drinking molten gold like I am right there. <laughs> if I eat nuggets, it'll come uh, out. <laughs> yeah, that's what rich people do when they got when they're bored and they got too much money. You know? Like those glitter capsules that were a thing for a hot minute. Do you guys remember that? Where like you could eat glitter and make your poo sparkle. That was like an Etsy. I don't know. I was at I was at the mall and they had those little like hydrogen puffs or whatever. So like the dragon's breath. Oh. You like eat these little like cereal puff looking things, and you got smoke coming out of your out of oh your mouth. God, that like, seems so no dangerous. Way. Like that's what they need in uh, in 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 Westeros, man. Yeah. <laughs> totally right. Like I'm a dragon. Yeah, sure. I mean, isn't that what basically what Mel does though? Where she's like, I control fire with this powder you didn't see. You know, <laughs> <laughs> she does a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, and and then obviously, I mean, we we've, we've, we've talked a lot about magic in the universe, but I mean, I think that was you know the magic didn't work so well until recently and shit starts working but if you've got years of you know doing card tricks and sleight of hand like you're gonna be real good at it you're just gonna Mm -hmm. keep doing what works you know yeah um you know as often as possible um danny yeah danny is an interesting case too because she seems also very comfortable with the idea of thinking about mormont as a bear like he's just her her sweet bear, her, you know, I mean, and it's not, I, again, oh, I don't true. get the impression that it's like because of the sigil on his chat. I think she's just like, he's like a bear. Like she, she thinks of people much more animalistically, I think, than a lot of the other point of view characters, including herself, which is very interesting. So like the usurper's dogs and, you know, like bear and the being the blood of the dragon, but then just, you know, being the mother and her, of her silver like, after Drogo dies, you know, she's always equating, you know, her, her silver and she's thinking of Drogo. And yeah. Kind of like, you know, he's, he was like half a horse. Well, I think if, <laughs> I think if, um, if anything else comes up with the clan totems, like if anything else occurs to us that we should definitely come back to it. But, um, it, I think we're starting to get into some of the, um, individual totems too. So just, Right. To, to kind of shift over to that. Um, in addition to the clan totem, Durkheim explores the individual totem, which, quote, expresses the personality of the person with whom it's associated and is regarded as the man's double or alter ego, his patron and his protector. Um, the individual totem is an identifier in addition to the totem of the clan to which the person belongs. Um, and it's usually an individual animal that's associated with an individual person that there's like a one-to-one um, relationship that's um, mutually beneficial. Uh, usually the man has some control over the individual totem animal um, or is believed to, and is um, not related to it genetically, but is um, sort of socially connected to it as one would be to like a best friend or something like that. So um, I think L- like, Mormont's raven would qualify. Oh, Mormont's I mean, raven. Yes. yes. Well yeah. done. <laughs> so I, I, I know there, I, I don't know if there are theories behind who that raven is um, and why it was so attached to Mormont until he died and then trying to attach corn. itself. To, yeah. <laughs> is it corn? <laughs> I mean, most people think it's a blood raven um, or, or, you know, brand going through the past or most people think blood raven is somehow influencing that raven at least sometimes yeah but, I, I think know. That's, yeah okay um well that's a good example right of the individual totem being well maybe not that but um i see your list uh sarah and mm-hmm. like the three-eyed crow that's um that's one where i guess the the definition is exact <laughs> yeah uh, 
maybe. Uh, I, I, or I'm trying to think of the hound, but that's that almost seems like a contradiction because he does not seem loyal to anyone in particular but himself. Mm. Um, so the characteristics of a hound or a dog, uh, maybe that is not an exact um, go, but in other characters, it seems to be. Um, like three. Well, but, I, but again, I think like we were saying with the, the houses themselves, they pick and choose the characteristics of these animals that are most advantageous to them in the situation. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, so, I mean, like a male lion, like doesn't do much, right. The females go out and hunt and all that. So they don't really pay attention to that. Like, you know, they're just like lions big and scary and, you know, eats shit. So, you know, obviously I think like with the hound, like, you know, he's just sort of taken something that was maybe a, a negative and he's he's embraced it and he looks at it more of, you know, as him being, you know, ferocious and mm -hmm. like he has that kind of, you know, that he's scrappy and all that versus um, Joffrey, I think, is the one that talks to him about his loyal hound. I think he's the only one that really ever says that. And, you know, Sandor's kind of always like, uh, you know, in his mind, but he's like, eh, this little shit, he just wants to slap him, you know? Well, he's, he's kind of like... Um... <laughs> the cynic Diogenes, right? So like the cynic, the, the philosophical oh, school yeah, of cynics good. is derived from the Greek word for dog. Um, and it was basically because Diogenes like didn't give two Fs and he would, you know, pee at dinner parties and like, kind of like he would behave like a dog and, you know, so um, it was more the kind of being in society, but not being of it or being sort of unapologetically, um, dismissive of normal social conventions and expectations. Um, so, I, I mean, I think in that respect, like it, maybe the hound is, is sort of a, an ironic pun on <laughs> the cynics. Sandor hates normies. Sandor hates normies. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like, <laughs> he would sleep in a giant jar in the marketplace if he could. Right? Like, <laughs> um, Indeed. Uh, and I, I do think it's, I do think it's worth pointing out in this context that um, the three dogs on in the Clegane sigil were from the kennel masters dogs that died yes. protecting one of the Lannisters from a lion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they definitely don't have that kind of, you know, affinity relationship that they might hope with lions. Like, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. it was after that, that uh, house Clegane um, derived the symbol, right? So it was uh, the mountains father, uh, the hounds father who, Started their house, right? Yes or no? A grandfather, maybe? I'm not sure. Oh, grandfather. Okay. Maybe grandfather, but he saved... Yeah, uh, it wasn't too far back, father. at least. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So th this is a family that picked their own sigil. Um, an example of someone who picked his own uh, sigil and is actually a, a current character in the book is uh, Littlefinger. Do you think <gasps> oh, that... Good... I don't know much about mocking... Because oh, he straight up changed his sigil. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did he have one before? What was it? Do you know? His grandfather's was the Titan of Bravos. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so so at some point he was like, no. Like, well, doesn't you know, he, he... He needed a new branding, right? Yeah, doesn't he explain to Sansa that he specifically rebranded because the Titan was too threatening? He was like, well, it wasn't a good fit, but it is sort of, it does right. make him a little bit... It's threatening, it's foreign, it's other, it reminds, mm -hmm. it, you know... This, his new sigil is kind of like, wait, where is he from? Who is this guy? You know, yeah, that's, it helps his cause. But it's also kind of funny because nobody refers to him as the Mockingbird or no, Birdman they don't take or, you know what I mean? He's, he's Littlefinger. <laughs> like, so he, he has, it's like, a, you know, when you try and make up your own cool nickname and you're stuck with the crappy one that your friend gave you. Like, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Oh, it's dripping with irony that nickname i'm gonna so. be boss man 25 you're like no you're not right yeah. <laughs> you're brown pants that's who you are uh, <laughs> that's right uh, that's all right or or um Edmure's yeah floppy so, fish. so i mean like we, we you mentioned like here you know the mountain um i don't know if you ever really identifies with like there's no particular mountain or anything to mm -hmm. He's just the mountain but he's just, guy. He's just, he's just a big dude, and he don't really talk a lot. So I think it's other people who call him the mountain, just because of his size, right? Right, right. And I think he just he doesn't really seem to like it or dislike it. Like, I yeah. don't know. You don't really get a lot on him there. Well, he's very – I mean, and obviously, like, we don't have a, a mountain POV chapter, thank God. 
but um, <laughs> oh, I can't even. They'll like, just be grunts. Just be like just a be descent grunts into madness. Um, yeah. I want a POV chapter now, now that he's undead. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, what does he think about all day? Um, but yeah, I mean, it does fit him though, because not only is he prodigiously large, he's also he's he's pretty much amoral, isn't he? I mean, he's he's just. He's, he is, really is just like a force of nature, right? Like an avalanche or a, you know, yeah. literally if a mountain fell on you, like would the mountain even notice? Probably not. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, so did you say amoral, right? Because mm-hmm. he doesn't seem cruel to me, even though he does cruel things, but he doesn't seem like he takes pleasure in, like Ramsey goes mm-hmm. out of his way to seek, you know, opportunities to be cruel, but the mountain just like he does horrible things. He he smashes all of Pia's th- uh, teeth. Mm-hmm. Uh, he kills people, but you know he'll go out tomorrow and you know carry on like nothing happened. Um, you know, so I I don't know how well um, in his case, for example, the association or even if he even re- uh, relies on. I think he relies on his reputation definitely because everyone's terrified of him. Um, and maybe that's why people gave him the nickname, the mountain that rides just to, you know, capture how inevitable your fate is if Mm -hmm. you ever come across this guy. Um, but what he makes of it is a mystery to all of us. On the other hand, you have people like, um, I don't know what Ramsey calls himself, but, uh, there are people who try to, (laughs) yeah, the bastard of Bolton. Yeah. Yeah. There are people who try to you know, convey this message of, you know, here's who I am or who here's who we are. Um, and here are the consequences if you deal with us, you know, mm-hmm. um, maybe they do it in their uh, sigil or in their words, their house words, um, you know, to kind of um, without being there or without being present, make sure that their identity is uh, known and, you know, is clear to everyone they encounter. Yeah, but, the the categories for the individual totem um, along the same lines as, as brand versus identif- identity versus biology. Um, for an individual totem, I think it could be a personal brand, kind of like um, Peter Baelish puts it out there to, to seem non-threatening and sort of non, um, versus self-identification, where it, like, it really is kind of the way that you think about yourself. Um, like maybe the blackfish is a, a good example of that. Yes, it's a good one. Um, yep. or, mm. or the vi- the red viper, right? That like this is yeah. who they see themselves as um, versus reputation, which I think is a good example for the mountain. Um, and I think the hound would probably be self-identification too, because I don't think he cares enough to like develop a personal brand necessarily. Um, yeah. Versus biology, which um, I, I don't, I don't know where the, the Starks fall into that um, because they do have like the, that sort of, psychological physical link with their you know sort of it's genetic or genealogical or whatever um but then again i think the targaryens and especially danny is is so much in all of those categories um that it's it's really interesting to think about because like she like her relationship with the eggs before they hatch and um how she she tells the baby like in um in game of thrones she has that fight with um, Viserys and then she holds one of the eggs and it says she feels the baby moving as though he were reaching out blood to blood which is like it's such a weird extra level of (laughs) identification that that you know very few if any of the other people's have even the even the wargs right like I don't think John is like I, you know, I love you because we're both wolf babies. Like, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. So uh, um, this is where magic makes things very interesting. Like, um, is there uh, a prevailing uh, idea in the books that the Starks and the, at least the Starks and the, um, oh God, the Targaryens, those two are more, they have more in common with, or they have more magic in their ancestry, and, and so right. that's why the relationships with these animals are stronger. That, than that's others. what I was just thinking is because those are the two where blood actually seems to be of significance. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I mean, you, you get the green seers with the reeds and all that, but the the blood of the first men and the warging ability of the Starks, 
and uh, the dreams and just kind of everything that comes along with being a Targaryen. You you don't see that in hardly any other house. Yeah, no, you definitely don't. It seems uh, that's unique to those two. I'm trying to think if any other house like has um, you have any of the, of these other manifestations like dreams, for example, or the ability to prophesy, see into the future or the past. I can't think of any. Maybe like I said, it's, really, it's really just the reeds that you, you, you hear a little bit of that about. Um, oh, okay. The, the how someone, the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, with the okay, green okay. seeing. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure, you know, someone who's probably listening can correct me. If there's In the past, there might be more related to other, other families. But it's, like, interesting, you know, the Starks get dire wolves. And it's, like, there's hints that pretty much all of them, uh, you know, minus Sansa because of reasons, mm-hmm. you know, could... could could do the warging, you know, if they just tried, essentially, mm-hmm. right? Uh, Bran does it pretty easily once he, because he he has the most open mind. He's you know this young child, and anything's possible, and he's you know stuck in this situation where he can't walk, and it just sort of happens. Yeah. Um, What's well, I mean, I think Rob is an interesting case too that often gets overlooked because he's not a point of view. Um, but the reports that we have of the way that he and Grey Wind work together in battle, and especially when Grey Wind finds the goat track and they sneak around um, the sort of unconquerable stronghold or whatever, but um, I mean, it actually turns into later later chapters and later reports. It, it dehumanizes him in ways that become more right. detrimental than beneficial, right? So like he has this reputation of you know, either eating the hearts himself or cutting hearts out and feeding them to his wolf. And, and the wolf becomes almost a, an extension of his own savagery. Like the, the wolf savagery kind of reflects back on him in a way that, um, yeah. I think is, is true. And, and you have, the, you, ha- you have to believe that that's all, you know, propaganda that's made up, but obviously there's, there's weird stuff going on. And because we don't see a lot of his campaign and we don't get him as a point of view character, unfortunately, I mean, I I would love to be in his head uh, to see how aware he is of, you know, is this connection forming? Is he fighting it? Is he embracing it? Is he trying to keep it a secret? Is this all just happening and he's just having weird dreams and doesn't get it? Um, I mean, I I think that'd be very interesting because clearly there's people around him pick up on something Mm -hmm. and then, you know, the propaganda machine runs with that. Yeah, that is very right. true. Yeah, you're correct. Um, I wonder if or how well informed, uh, like the folks in King's Landing are aware, uh, Tywin and them, um, of what goes on in Rob's camp. Because there's some things he does in an audience, for example, like when his mother came back, and I think she was having a conversation with him, and he became angry, but he didn't say anything. It was Grey Wind who started growling or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wonder if reports like that go back right. to anyone else. Um, and, you know, if it's so evident, like with the Targaryens, it was. Go back to when, you know, um, Jaehaerys, even after Jaehaerys, like the the um, the Dance of the Dragons, when, you know, one dragon would roar because he sensed another and it was their masters. Their masters are the ones who hate each other, like, you know, um, Jaehaerys uh, uh, and uh, Luke and, and all of them. Um, so people, I think, would associate that kind of uh, madness with the Targaryens because it was so evident when they were upset, their beasts were upset. So they were otherworldly kind of people. Um, and, and and I agree, It's maybe it's the same with the Starks. But, but we don't, even if we don't have um, an insight into... Um, Rob's mind, could we safely assume that the relationship is the same with all the Starks? So can we look at Bran, for example, and how he is uh, growing with his relationship with um, with Summer and assume that that's what's happening to Rob as well, even though the circumstances are different, uh, their challenges are different, and maybe their own you know struggles are different, but mm-hmm. could it be somewhat the same? Yeah, I mean, the awareness is obviously different, but I think it's all the same root, you know, warging ability. I mean, again, the only one that we don't really see a hint of that from is Sansa because, you know, Lady dies so quickly. Well, but even so... I'm sure she would have had that chance as well. I mean, even so, in that that chapter when Nymeria attacks Joffrey, Sansa thinks to herself about how the wolves are mirroring the personalities of their owners. Um, 
and right because ladies uh-huh. she's so demure and, yeah. yeah and then when sansa is afraid of ill and pain lady starts growling and bristling and so i mean we do have at least some kind of um empathy that's that's present between them and i mean how much of that is just like you know a, a dog sensing that its owner is upset but there's a, there's a sense in which even sansa herself you know remarks on how ridiculous it is that nightmare is like this straight up ragamuffin and lady you know eats bacon under the table like a queen like you know it's just and it, don't even mention shaggy dog i know well, <laughs> right exactly rickon is another really good example of um of the way that that connection happens unconsciously or, or at least subconsciously right um although i i have maybe this is getting into tinfoil territory but i have a sense that the relationship is much more reciprocal in terms of like personality affect and stuff like that that um yeah like danny gets much more aggressive and much much less um cautious i guess like once the dragons hatch and i think part of that is just like what i got three dragons fuck you but like i i I do think that there's some kind of um some kind of reciprocal affect that happens so like whether yeah like whether shaggy dog is as wild as he is because he's mind linked with a three-year-old or whether rickon as a three-year-old like bites people because he's mind linked with a dog or with a wolf that's already a little bit but it becomes it becomes a feedback loop of Mm -hmm. this feral wolf that doesn't have a more mature mind to connect with so it develops characteristics which it then sends back to rickon i mean that's kind of how i Mm -hmm. i feel and i mean there's a theory that um i mean you said like danny's become more aggressive and there's a theory that as she gets closer to drogon maybe we'll start seeing more of like the dragon come out, yeah. you know, that'll, that'll be influencing her, her more. Well, and I mean, she has that dream that I think has to be so important as far as like, at least the way that we understand her relationship with the dragons, where I think it's when she's miscarrying, um, Rago, but she dreams that she sprouts dragon wings. So in all of her previous dreams, like she has been relating to the dragon or she's been kind of connecting with the dragon or, or seeing the dragon and being afraid of it or being burned by its fire or whatever. But like in this one, her, her back actually rips open and wings come out. Um, and I, I don't know, like, I don't know. Danny's a really interesting case for me because on one hand, like she does have the silver, which is pretty clearly an important totemic association that she has during her time with the Dothraki. But then, um, like is it in her blood because she's a targaryen or is she like a targaryen clan plus individual dragon totem and they just happen to be the same and like what does that mean as far as her dragonness i don't know she's a, she's a, she's really interesting in this in this dynamic because is, she is sort of all of the things that a totem can be and and yeah. none of them is um as distinct as they usually are which is troubling i think can we safely assume that in danny's case and in any of the stark kids we're discussing something separate uh than you know just actual just merely symbolism so when you describe for yeah. example silver means for her mm-hmm. and maybe um what the white hearth that uh coat that she has where she puts it on whenever she feels vulnerable or when oh, she wants yeah. to feel safe so that is something a uh, mere human, yes, would use a totem for, yes? Is, is that correct? Um, meanwhile, when she has her dragon dreams or when she has those, you know, out of this world, um, you know, experiences with her dragon or in dreams, that's something different that the author, J.R.M., is trying to allude to. And that's just a question I'm asking. Uh, well, I mean, if we're, if we're thinking about it in terms of what Durkheim either suggests or, or sort of catalogs about beliefs in individual totems in real religion. Um, he says that there, there are the closest of bonds between the individual and the animal whose name he bears. The nature of the animal is part and parcel of the man who has its qualities as well as its faults. Um, the man is sometimes thought capable of assuming the animal's form and the animal is regarded as the man's double alter ego protector and patron. 
um, while the man can act upon the animal, he gives it orders and has power over it. So I think that there is, um, at least in this, this totemic system of belief, there is a sense that um, there is a beyond a symbolic linkage, like that there is actually a, a psychic linkage or a spiritual linkage um, between an individual animal and an individual person who has that animal as so, its totem. What about like the non-animalistic totems? So, I mean, some of this stuff is, you know, um, I mean, obviously much, there's no connection. It's, you know, much less than like the, the dire wolves and all that, but like Dario with his ladies, for instance, or, um, mm-hmm. uh, what's this, um, Davos with his finger bones, with his luck. Yeah. Like there's definitely a huge connection there. I mean, there, there's nothing to it, I think, other than his own. And, and, you know, Dario uses his as kind of part of his branding, part of his image, whereas uh, Davos doesn't. Like, it's all, you know, just a deeply personal thing. Like, you know, he, he remembers his his cutoff digits and is always grasping them. And, yeah. you know. Um, well, but then Mel has that, that line that drives everybody crazy when she's talking about the glamour that she put on Mance, where she says you have to have something, or like Rattleshirt's bone armor, um, where she says you have to have something personal that you can use to anchor the glamour. And, and one of the examples that she gives is a bag of finger bones, which is like such a random, cause he's already lost them at that point, like books earlier, you know? So. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> I'm just looking at the comment about onions. It's, sorry. Mm. Yeah. He's the uh, onion knight. Yeah. Yeah. He uses his onions for branding yeah. and cooking too. Who knows? Okay. Uh, <laughs> If you were to cook an onion in front of Davos, would he be upset? Like, why are you doing this to my friends? You know, I well, if you know. did it, you did it ritualistically. <laughs> if only he'd had he'd had a ship full of potatoes. Westeros you know? would be very different. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Potato Knight. Oh my god, his, his so, eyes and nose are removable and rearrangeable. The, he, and... He, the potato <laughs> ship that he was gonna that he was gonna smuggle got sank, so he sank. He brought the onions oh instead. And then the potatoes all died off because of that. That's what that's what Sister Stu that's why. has that's a why potato you never, base because they found them. Never hear about potatoes. them. <laughs> so uh, it comes to me that these three houses you've mentioned, uh, Targaryens, the, um, the Starks, and the Reeds, for the most part, they were the only ones who did not intermingle with the... Um, with the Andals, who were just explorers, they weren't re- they weren't deep into magic. So I'm thinking even of the first men, like the wildlings, for example, the free folk. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not interbred, or they never interbred with the uh, Andals. So you find these instances of magic and the deep connections with animals, or the ability to warg into animals, strong with the Targaryens, the uh, the the. Uh, um, Starks, the, the weirwoods. We haven't even talked about the weirwoods. That's right. <gasps> oh uh, yeah. So if if it's uh, safe to say that Martin was consistent in his um, characterization of these different people, mm-hmm. um, with you know like the uh, the Lannisters, for example, they're they're purely Andals, if I'm not mistaken. So none of them exhibit any sort of um, you know, tendency to, to, to magic or to be able to communicate with animals or have a special bond with lions. Right. Uh, Could that then, could we safely assume using the theory of, or using our understanding of, you know, what these associations or connections can mean, uh, can we safely say that the Starks, um, or this story is really about those two families, the Starks and the Targaryens and this ability they have and, what it means for right me. i mean it's the song of ice and fire so i mean i, I, I yeah i mean I, um hopefully it'll fur and fire be important but <laughs> uh, well, I, well i mean you, true. you raise an interesting point though wilson that um among the free folk being a being a warg and what and am i am i wrong in thinking that wargs are specifically wolves and then skin changers are any animal or that... everything else okay. yeah i mean w- a lot of times um, we, they refer to warging, like people will talk about warging, it's just like being able to to do other stuff. But in the books, mm-hmm. it's kind of specific that like the wargs are the people that, you know, the wolves are kind of like the most common thing. Mm-hmm. And then like the people that can go beyond that, like Varamir, you know, yeah. um, the, he can skin change into multiple animals because, you know, he's just cool like that. Yeah. Because well, there are other wargs they mention in the books, but we never see them. 
No, they, they don't. But but um, they work like the ability to work is is being able to connect with an animal. Um, I'm not sure that it's specific to wolves. I think when Varimir six skins is um, reminiscent in the beginning of uh, the dance with dragons, he talks about how easy it is to walk with a wolf because they're very obedient. They've been so close to man. Oh, sure. It's not hard to take them over, but it's harder to take over, you know, like a hawk or uh, a bear because they're wild, but they have the ability to do that. Um, and with the Starks, I don't know about the history of the Starks with wolves. Maybe they were wargs and, you know, they were able to do that in their early history, but we don't yet have literature from um, George's world to explain that to us, right? Mm -hmm. We just know that so, there's a... So, sorry, hi guys. Hi. In, all my co-workers have gone, so I can talk now. All right, welcome in, then. So yeah, this is, this is Michael going? joining us. Welcome, guys. In uh, the world of ice and fire, actually, um, it's, it says that when the Starks were conquering the north and making it one kingdom, they would conquer these other warg families and they would marry their daughters. Um, <gasps> so I think it's, well, it's implied in the world of ice and fire, this is where their warging ability comes from, from these marriages they would make with. They might have also conquered the children of the forest as well, um, or interbred individuals of them. Isn't that one of the the theories about R plus L that like that that may have been his motivation that she actually came from a skin changing bloodline and that there was some connection to dragon riding and and uh, dragon. Well, it's definitely a theory. I, yeah, I would yeah, be yeah. very interested how the warging affects dragons. Because, again, World of Ice and Fire also implies with the Targaryens, mm -hmm. at least one of the theories is that, like, magical gene splicing was going on. Yeah. And that's why the blood of the dragon is so yeah. resonant. Because nobody, like, I don't think the Starks claim to have the blood of the wolf, right? They're, they they are wolves, either with, a, with an uppercase or a lowercase, right? Like, but they don't, that, that blood of verbiage is very, very particular to... Well, to Viserys, and then to Danny, sort of by influence, by his influence, or then later, like the idea that she's genetically connected, like that she's the mother of dragons, that she nursed them, that she, you know, like that that she is. She's got dragon blood. Right, exactly. Like that. There's a. Yeah. There's a. You know that that Rhaegal the reference had wings to the dragon tail, blood like, is interesting. Mm -hmm. Like. Because a lot of times, it, like, the way they talk about Targaryens is, like, they almost do share DNA or they seem to think that, which, I mean, doesn't seem to be possible. But the Starks, the First Men, they never talk about them being, you know, like, wolf blood or anything mm -hmm. like that. Not really. Well, no. Derek does mention it once with Brandon, but I don't think it's in the same capacity as just saying he has a tempo. Not, like, literally. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it the oh, sorry, Durkheim's um, explanation of or, or sort of accounting for the three ways that the relationship of the clan to the totemic animal was explained is one that there used to be a human animal hybrid that then basically like evolved separately into the human and then the animal um, or that that the clan is uh, descended from the animal or the animal who then was metamorphosized into human who became their primary ancestor, or that they were descended from a man who lived among the animals, that particular animal long enough that he basically grew to be one of them. Um, so I think that would be that last one, the sort of most scientific or most sort of realistic would be the explanation for the the Starks or sort of the closest explanation to the Starks. Um, and then the, the question mark for the Targaryens would be whether it was like a dragon human hybrid or whether it was a dragon who somehow became a human that they're like related to. Um, or if they're all just insane. Although I don't think those are, I don't think those are necessarily mutually exclusive possibilities. The like, dragon human hybrids live on the other moon. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> they just didn't travel as but far. In the case of the Targaryens, I think that that is a, that's very accurate because uh, they it seems that they want to set themselves apart from other people, and so the fact that they are the blood of the dragon it's not just a symbol to them. It's you know we don't get sick, uh, we are different. We're allowed to do things that you can't because you know we're different, and we need to be this way because our whole constitution is different from yours. Mm -hmm. So you know the blood is. 
uh, or who we are is different. And this dragon is a symbol of that. Whereas the Starks, I don't know that they generally, you know, make the same um, inference when they talk about being wolves. Um, it seems to me the Starks as a motto or as a way of identification, they identify themselves um, more as northerners when they compare themselves to the rest of, you know, Westeros. Um, I think they, they aspire to be different or they, they consider their values different because they're Northmen. So um, I'm trying to think of Ned Stark, who, you know, hates the South because of all their politics and, and double dealing. And he sees himself as an honest Northman where, you know, your word counts for more than anything else. Um, I don't know that he was aware of any, you know, um, connection he had with wolves specifically or any magical abilities. But um, as for setting yourselves apart, he did that very much. In fact, I think um, same thing with his, I, well, I don't know about his sister, but um, they just seem different. Brad, um, not Bran, sorry. What's his name? Um, the young wolf. Uh, oh, Rob. Rob. Yeah. yeah Rob. Rob, Rob is, uh, is really, when like when uh, King Baratheon comes down, um, to or co goes up to Winterfell and they're having these interactions. Uh, Rob refers to, or he he thinks back on the differences and um, it's it's very clear to him that Northern people are different from all these other people and and that's important to them. I think um, you know in 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 all their motivations that they are different, um, but they do it more because of where they're from, not because of the link they have with. A wolf or or some kind of animal that's that's how i i think of those two i i think that's a great point and i think it's it's an interesting relation to the fact that dark kind of explains the origin of the word totem is a term that actually means village or dwelling place so the idea that the north like the geographical self-identification is primary or foundational for this animistic self-identification, right? That like you probably on one hand, you probably wouldn't associate with an animal that isn't from the same area or doesn't share the same kind of like survival. You know I mean? Like I, I doubt the Starks would ever have been like a Kraken or, a, you know, cause they live in the, on the land and they, yeah. you know, the, the wolves are ubiquitous and they're important. Um, and they also are capable of surviving in this very, um, this very specific environment. Well I think going back to kind of the, like the clan idea, like the most successful, um, at least in the story, like your Starks and your Lannisters and all that, like they have vassal lords that have their own, you know, sigils, their own, own things that they identify, right? But mm -hmm. you still get um, some identification, at least at certain moments, as like you might get Umbers or Car Starks or someone else that will refer to themselves as kind of wolves, like in the general sense, yeah. um, especially especially in wartime. And so, but not, not all of them do that. Well, it's interesting too, because that becomes, especially in the, in the later books, like as the devastation in the Riverlands is really, um, like as Brienne is, is witnessing it and Jamie is witnessing it, it becomes um, a singular identification, right? So they're like, I don't know, did wolves do it? Did, did, you know, lions do it? Who cares? Like, are you a wolf or a lion? It doesn't matter. You're burning my crops and nobody cares, right? So it almost becomes rather than a, a point of pride or a point of, um, identification it almost becomes a, a a generic kind of uh curse almost you know like to to say like the when they find the hanged women and it just says they lay with lions um like that there's there's a dehumanization like a radical dehumanization and a radical anonymity to it that happens yeah. um as as the devastation progresses which i think is really interesting it, it, yeah, it, it seems that it's used by their opponents um, more as a generalization of who these people are, especially in relation to the act. So when, you know, like when when they hang those women, um, the, the, the sign lie, uh, is that they lay with wolves. So, you know, they must be horrible because these wolves are all horrible people. That's the Lannisters or whoever is making that reference, um, trying to make you know, make that association with wolves and the sacrilege of being associated with them. Um, and that's why they put that sign up. I wonder if the Northern people, because I think the Northerners, they they distinguish themselves. Like the, the 
the only wolves up north are, or the dire wolves are the Starks. So Umber, for example, who loves the Starks and they're fiercely loyal to the Starks. I don't know if they consider themselves wolves or they consider the, some, themselves Northmen and therefore kin to the wolves. So when, when, um, when, for example, they're saying the North remembers in relation to, or when they are addressing the phrase, especially, you know, here's what you did to our Northmen, the North remembers, you're in trouble. Um, I wonder if then the North could serve as a totem, if a totem is a unifying symbol. Um, and that's just a question I'm, yeah, I'm asking. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely, I think so. Um, and I, I think Winterfell becomes the sort of intermediary between the Stark wolves and the North as enormous clan, right? The, the North as kind of not South yeah. or, or not East. Uh -huh. um, so that those great houses and their ancestral seats become, like I said, like a, a kind of in between um, for those, for the, for the identity of the clan expanding outward, right? So you have the dire wolves and then you have like Winterfell men and then you have the North. But I think it's, it's, concentric circles rather than isolated um isolated groups but yeah I, I i do think that the geographical um and maybe even more than geographical like the environmental commonalities um like when when um asha is uh going through the snow right and they're with stannis and they're all sort of slogging through the snow and all the northmen are like this isn't snow you babies you know and and all the, <laughs> the sovereign lords are, are you know their yeah. horses are freezing in their tracks and things and um yeah i mean i i can see where the the anthropological or the sociological totemism comes into it because if you as a people as a human people are accustomed to wearing layers and growing big bushy beards and knowing the strategies to keep your fingers and toes from falling off when there's six feet of snow outside, that this becomes an identity shaped by the environment and something that you have in common with the indigenous animals. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I definitely see like how those things become intertwined because like if you're if your best bet not to freeze to death is to wear a bear skin, like you're going to be pretty glad that that bear had a skin that would keep it warm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's, I don't know. It's, it, there's a, there's a, but, but yeah. in your question about how uh, a totem or, or a symbol unifies a people, mm -hmm. would the North be more effective? Cause I don't know if this was uh, George's intention, but the North can galvanize such a great area. They can yeah. galvanize and head south or act together as one because that identity unites them so well. I'm trying to think, or I remember the Dance of the Dragons where, um, you know, the Northmen all come to one person's aid, like all of them, the Dustins, and they all come together and then march south and have, you know, um, and, and fight in that war. Um, not because, you know, they they identified with one of the claimants more, but because a North man made a promise and all of them, yeah. you know, got down together and, and headed south. Um, I don't know that any other, you know, um, area in Westeros can, you know, or has shown that kind of unity um, where something else was not involved, you know, maybe some kind of political sta stake or territory was involved. Like but the North seems to be able to, yeah, mm -hmm. they seem to be able to move as a group, as a big group, uh, where the South is concerned. I'm sure when they're by themselves, they can have their own, uh, or they have their own conflicts. But we never see that because, you know, their identity as Northmen or North people um, seems to 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 be operative you know it's it's how it governs them it keeps them together even though they're they're separate they have these you know unifying customs because they're in the north like uh leaving your younger ones um if you're old going out into the snow to die because you know when winter has come and you want your younger ones to survive those practices are are universal in the north so maybe their experiences like you say um shape more of their their identity and, and and can serve to unite an entire super clan yeah. uh, more effective. 
I love that term. That's such a great term. Like, yeah, super. That's, cool. yeah, super cool. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that's, I think that's such a fantastic point, especially because, um, or it's, it's so interesting and it's so, um, so noticeable in a lot of ways because the North geographically is so enormous compared to the rest of, um, the rest of Westeros. Along the same lines, do you think that we could call the Iron Throne a totem? An ineffective totem? Well, in effect, well, I don't know, because I mean, it does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's increasingly less effective, I guess, is maybe. But I mean, I think at least in the way that it was originally created. Well, they, they ascribe belief to the fact that if you get cut on it, you, you know, aren't fit to be king and shit. I mean, yeah, it does. It does have its own almost like personality or life or something to it, doesn't it? I mean, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't suggest that anybody, you know, imagines themselves as being descended from the Iron Throne or whatever. So it, it may, it may be more emblem than totem, but I do, I do think that, especially in the way that it was created, right? Like from all the swords that, um, that Aegon collected from the people that he had defeated, that it was at least built with the intention of, being a unifying object, right? Like an object of focus and um, a, a sort of fixed point for collective identity um, in a way that that the totem sometimes is. Can, uh, can you, uh, Sarah, for the purpose of the rest of us, I guess, uh, uh, state the difference between an emblem and a totem? Oh, um, well, the totem would be the, the kinds of things that Darkheim is defining, right? So um, the investment in um, the the clan, the power of the clan or the power of the collective particularly, right? And the connection between that collective self-identification um, and the expectations, the, the pressures and the... Um, also the, the prestige and things that come along with that. Whereas an emblem would just be a, a symbol of something like some bigger idea um not necessarily the idea of a of a collective um so so a sigil for example won't be it's more of a totem than an emblem it's less of a a symbol more of more of something having to do with identity i think so i think that i mean i think that what our discussion has suggested is that there are some sigils that are more emblematic than they are totemic so I would say like maybe the Tyrell Rose is a really good example of an emblem rather than a totem because I don't think they think of themselves as roses necessarily. Um, Are you sure? Because uh, well, I mean they, they, they do strong. They do. Yeah, they have roses. Is it like yeah, does anybody else remember that Flintstones vitamins commercial like the like ten million strong and growing like I was thinking and about growing. that it, right yeah. like I was thinking about that or that would be like their their house song or whatever but. Anyway, yeah. Um, so I, I mean, just, I, yeah, yeah. Like I don't, I don't know that they. I mean, I don't know. They're they're weird kids, but it, <laughs> it's it seems more like a brand, which I, I guess maybe you could think of an emblem as as like a pure brand where they're like we're you know pretty, but we're also you know a little bit dangerous, and we we grow and smell nicely and. You know, but watch out, we're thorns. You know, it, yeah. I don't know. It just it, it just seems very like I'm yeah, not explaining this I, well at all because the Tyrells. But it doesn't inspire it. like fanatical. Yeah, like, you're kind of like, oh, that's nice. Yeah, I like those guys, but it's not it's not a it's not something you can cling to when you've lost your way as as far as like who you are or where you belong. I don't think. I mean, I don't know. Maybe some people feel right. Like, like, like about someone might like Coca Cola. They might be into Coca Cola. Maybe have some. Coca-Cola paraphernalia in their house. Yeah. But they're like a huge fan of a sports team. If that sports team wins the Super Bowl or loses a big game or moves to cities, it like it really affects them. Yes. You know what I mean? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So it is. It's a brand yeah, it's a brand versus like a, a collective, right? Yeah. Um so <laughs> the emblem would, would tend more towards brand than like is it a logo, right? <laughs> with whatever <laughs> like, with okay. whatever. So the question, because um, I mean, I was going to ask about 
whether or not the Iron Throne was more emblematic. I think you already answered that question. Um, more as a symbol of Aegon's conquest as opposed to an identity that people can subscribe to. So people don't see the Iron Throne and think, oh, that's, you know, that's, <laughs> I'm part of that throne. It's more like yeah. this Iron Throne symbolizes we all serve the Targaryens because they won and beat all of us and there are swords all melted together upon this gigantic throne before which we must bow every day. Yeah, <laughs> so. I guess, I, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But I don't think, I don't get the impression, at least, or I didn't get the impression from Fire and Blood that he created it as a personal symbol or as a family symbol. Like, it was supposed to be a symbol of... It was meant to be intimidating. Like okay, all right, yeah. His conquest, right? Like we, I won, and this is for you to always remember that I won. <laughs> yeah. And you said, right. So that w whenever you come to court, you can be like, you know, if, if you have any sort of disagreement, you're like, which one of these was yours again? Was <laughs> 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 it Tyrell? Look, yeah. Uh, here's your sword right uh, here. Yeah. My... The fact that he no. uses dragon fire to forge it together is basically saying your swords are useless because I have a dragon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I think ice could could almost be um, a, a personal. Well, I don't know. That might be a bit of a stretch because it is their ancestral sword. So I was going to say ice could almost be at least for his kids could be um, a personal symbol or a personal totem for Eddard. Because like he takes such good care of it, and then for all yeah. of his kids, that's my father's sword, not like Sansa. She's like, "What happened to my father's sword?" It's not exactly. Sure. I was like, going to refer to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, is yeah. it safe to say that when something that could be an emblem carries significant meaning, meaning that can readily be used to identify a person? So you know, ice with the Starks. Or um, I'm trying to think of a different symbol. Like when does an object cease to become an emblem and turns into a totem like um does it really have to be super distinct um in certain cases and identify not exactly but maybe very close to the character of the people or the persons or something they believe in i'm thinking of dawn for house dane because only certain individuals get dawn they have to be worthy uh, yeah. of it yeah so that would be a personal, yeah yeah that would definitely be that would be like a really weird in-between example because it would be the collective totem or the collective symbol of all of the stars of the morning, like going back. So it would carry the expectations of like living up to that. Isn't that what they're called? The star of the, star of the morning? Uh, the, sword, the sword of the morning. Sword, sword of the, sword of the morning. morning. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Um, so you it carries that that ancestral expectation of like that very specific group but it's a, it's not a dane association so it is like the individual but then it's also like a, a reduced collective i don't know that's a that's a really interesting yeah i don't i don't know that's a really great example it sounds like the danes are are like the people who've been swords of the morning they've been exceptionally you know chivalrous and very upright in their character like the current uh, lord of starfall the the dane guy um who is currently in Dorne? He he doesn't sound like someone who should carry that sword. Dark Star. Uh, Dark Star. Yeah. He's just a vassal branch of the Danes. He's not the oh, one, thankfully. He? Oh, I see. Because yeah, yeah, he has his own seat, doesn't he? High so, Hermitage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you guys remember who who was in the river, Riverlands with uh, Beric Dondarrion as his squire? Is that the Lord of Starfall mm -hmm. or? Yeah. The, Future Lord of Starfall. He's the. I think he's the Lord right now, isn't he? Maybe uh, future Lord, just the heir. Future. Eddard. N Ned. Yeah. Yeah. Ned. Okay. Is he not? Is he? Is, is his father still alive? I thought he was the Lord of Starfall. I think the father's still around, doing something, just being the Lord. <laughs> just lording it over. So. <laughs> lordy, um, lord. Well, so okay, so the, this emblem versus totem question is a very interesting one, and it's one that is obviously. A pretty, a pretty slippery thing, especially when it comes to to things that aren't sigils, because the sigil obviously carries the identity of the house and things like that. Um, but we haven't really talked about Sunspear, um, about the Martell sigil, and whether that could be considered totemic. And I think it, I think it can, because it's 
imagined as a unification of the Martels and the Roinar, um, right? Isn't yeah. it the the Roinar Sun and the Yeah, and the Martel Sphere. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's a it's a almost like a foundational totem for the, a new clan, right? Like a new unified clan invested with um, their collective, their new collective identity. I don't know. It's, Symbolically, it's, it's it's very interesting because, like the, it's very rare that the houses will use a force of nature as their uh, sigil. Oh. So that serves to other the Martels in a sense by having the sun. That's and really... then the sphere obviously represents that the Martels weren't anyone important back in the day. It was only when Nymeria came that she made them great. <laughs> that's that's a really interesting point. Well, uh, the sun it see, uh, sounds like a, a weapon for the Martels for any invaders. When uh, people march south to invade the Martels, um, the sun usually does does them in uh, on the Boneway and and in all those places. But but it seems that their sigil predates any invasion that we know of. So I don't know if that was intentional on their part, but it sounds like uh, they are the only ones with the sun or anything um, elemental on their sigil. I'm trying to think. Oh, well, Barak. Dark... So yeah, the Dondarians have a lightning, lightning. bolt, so it's not, it's not an entirely it's not uh, rule that fits in every situation, but it's, it's just rare, is what I mean. Maybe people just get struck by lightning a lot near his castle. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go just, there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, Wilson, to go back to Yeah, your... and then, well, Stannis is, Stannis is like... Um, Lord of Light symbol, right? Is the is it the what is it? Oh, it's the, the flaming firing, heart. The firing heart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the the mystery knight symbols are like the ones that knights sort of just make up for themselves on the spot, like dunk dunks tree and shooting star, um, yeah. or the laughing tree, which is what got me thinking about it. But um, I think those would be a good example of emblems because they don't carry any kind of like there's a personal significance to them but they don't there isn't a personal um relationship necessarily between the knight and the thing that's on his shield um nor is it evocative of a a larger group or a larger um historical continuity right so it's something that they just made up because they thought it was cool whereas like the snail knight and duncan egg arguably could be a totem because he he wants to portray himself as, um, you know, associated with the snail. Well, Not of interest. Right. Beneath notice. Yeah, I really like the snail knights. Me too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, it's, it's wonderful. I don't know how intentional uh, George Martin was in writing these things, or maybe the fact that he borrowed them from history mm-hmm. really works well with, you know, yeah. Yeah. Our ability to uh, analyze these things because it it just seems very intentional. Um, I tried to look up symbolism in ancient, well, not ancient, in medieval times, and if the roses meant more than just emblems for those houses, and maybe their conflicts are what shaped their history more than, you know, their association with any particular, um, you know, I don't know, ideal. That's. Um, that's symbolized by their choice of the rose. I don't know. Uh, I couldn't find anything significant, but it's just wonderful that um, we can read into these things so deeply in George's world um, um, as we do. Yeah. yeah, one of the um, one of the the sort of corollary investigations that I did for this text was to look at the medieval beast series which if you guys haven't checked those out i highly recommend perusing them i can post a link in the show notes to a really good site where they've digitized a lot of them and um show the comparative kind of uh analyses or the the sociocultural weights that came with a lot of these animals but it's very interesting to think about um like the the sort of medievalisms that are at work here where these particular animals had had very particular associations um in our world and um, to think about whether those associations are consistent um, in, in Song of Ice and Fire, whether they're um, modified a little bit, but um, I'll definitely post those too. Cause they're, they're fun to think about. 
Yes, indeed. Well, Michael, did you have any um, any totems that you wanted to talk about? We didn't really talk about the Dothraki and their horses, which I think is probably one of the most straightforward examples of a, a clan totem, right? That they um, believe themselves to be descended from and ultimately reclaimed by the Great Stallion um, and, and that they're all one herd and, you know, I mean, that they're linguistically, but then also, or, or terminologically, but also um, biologically or, or genealogically to a certain extent, they associate very closely with their horses. Um, but were, were there any other points that you wanted to touch on at all since you... Oh, what are some interesting ones? Gendry's bullhead, maybe? <gasps> oh, that one's simple, Ooh. I would say. That's a... I don't know. I mean, it, it, it could be... Because he certainly is bullheaded, isn't he? <laughs> right? Like, whether yeah, well, or not that was <laughs> delivered on his part, but it, it does become... Um, that's, a, that's a really good one. I like that one a lot, yeah. Do you think he gave it as much thought when he made that thing, or it was just something he thought was cool? Because <laughs> he is very stubborn. Uh, but I don't know if that was... <laughs> That was his intention. Maybe he just wanted to look fearsome, you know? I don't know, because I can't think... I mean, he managed to pick one of the very few animals in Westeros that, at least as far as we know, is unrepresented in heraldry. Yeah, uh-huh. Which is kind uh-huh. of... I mean, for as much as they talk about aurochs and stuff, you would think that somebody would have <laughs> something, you know, some some bull or, or something, but I can't think of... Yeah, I, think I think... Anybody. Yeah, they were more, uh, it, it was more of a derogatory term to be referred to as an aura, right? <laughs> yeah. <'Cause, laughs> like, yeah. <"Whoa."> yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, can, we, can we talk about the Dothraki? Because that's an interesting sure. one. Um, I wonder if, how much you can read into, like the Dothraki, um, I almost thought that George used... Um, um the Genghis Khan and his clan as a uh as a canvas to model model the Dothraki on their ways like um maybe he just did it for warfare or trying to you know make them unique in how they fight but the similarities there are are quite striking I don't know how much because uh, like the Dothraki won't uh cross any water that their horses can drink mm-hmm. uh, right yeah they I don't know if their religion is horsey in nature, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I can't remember what, um, I haven't read too far into what the Dosh Kaleen symbolize or if there's anything related to the horse in the there. The stallion that mounts the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, that's it's true. That's one of their big prophecies, true. Mm-hmm. Um, so with Khal Drogo, like he, he did not want to go over to help Danny. Um, get her father's kingdom back because it meant nothing to him. He just had a wife and he was going to live his life, you know, doing what he always did. Uh, but once his she was attacked, you know, all of a sudden all that um, superstition about crossing, you know, the, the poison water, none of that meant anything to him. He was going to go, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I don't know how, how strong the uh, attachment is for them or what the meaning is. Paul Drogo always struck me as like unusually cosmopolitan. Yeah. Um, in the fact that he, yeah, married Daenerys, who's you know not Dothraki. Well, or that he he only had her as his wife, like that he didn't have other wives, and that he had a a mansion, even if he wasn't there very often, right? Like that he. he oh, had, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. He is. He is yep. kind of iconoclastic and all in a. A number of <laughs> Dothraki ways, isn't he? Um, he was very retro. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm. I'm very interested in thinking about what might have happened if Danny had managed to hatch her eggs while Drogo was still around. I mean, it's a it's a pretty mm, hypothetical thing, but like a lot of winged so, horses <laughs> symbolism, right? That, that breathe fire. Would, yeah. Would Drogo have joined like? Danny's Kalasar or like would he, like would he have had a hard time with that is what you're saying or I, yeah or whether he would have I, I almost think he would have just killed the dragon like I don't think he would have let her 
keep the dragons. I, I think he like, probably would have thought it was cute, these cute little dragons, and just sort of laughed it off until they got bigger. Uh, right? Yeah, and started eating a horse. <laughs> and then was like, oh, wait a second, these things are dangerous. Yeah, kind of like the rest but, of Essos. <laughs> Like, oh. But again, Khal Drogo being like the, the one who will do what other Dothraki won't, he would see an opportunity in these dragons. I feel like he would have he would have ridden one. It would have been like later stallion. <laughs> well think about the literally the the stallion that mounts the world, yeah? Mm-hmm. On a dragon. That yeah. would be fun. Well that's the that's one of that's another theory, isn't it, that's out there that Drogon is actually her her son, who's the stallion who mounts the world, like that, or the yeah. two of them together, or, or whatever. But um. I always think uh, Drogon is Drogo reincarnated, you know, because of his wild nature and his—he's the biggest of them all. He's the most, you know, uh, he's the strongest. He's the most uh, imposing mm-hmm. in his uh, in his means. I almost feel like George, like for if if. Khal Drogo and you know the tragedy of his death had not happened. Danny would have just been a Dothraki housewife for the entire uh, series. It almost feels like he needed to die, and that calamity had to happen yeah. for dragon blood to activate. You know. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know how much destiny and prophecy you know yeah. he's trying. I mean, to... you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. They call her the daughter of death in the house of the undying. So yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's yeah. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's so you know it would be nice to think of what, how you know that union would have looked like and what they would have done ultimately. Um, I think the same can be said for Westeros. You think of the Lannisters; they've been trying to be important for a long time. But if Ares was not mad, um, I don't know that Tywin and the Lannisters would have seized power the way they did i think they would have just remained the way they are so or or the baratheons become so um imposing so it almost feels like these you know these big shifts are related to each other in some way um and uh maybe that's why the iron throne could never unite them because they're just so they're so big and i don't think there's room in westeros for all these all these houses i mm-hmm. i truly don't think so <laughs> yeah I, I mean i think yeah i think there's a reason that they were seven kingdoms for so long and then <laughs> yeah um, isn't just as a side note isn't bitter steel's sigil a horse dragon isn't it a horse like a winged oh, horse oh yeah it fire? is it is mm-hmm. yeah cuz it's the br- brackens He's yeah, a bracken and then, yeah yes yes yeah. Uh, Bittersteel did it. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> you found the hybrid. <laughs> yeah, that would have been that would have been super cool. Well yeah. done. Thanks. Well done. <laughs> um, I, I just Danny is such a, a fascinating. Like I really want to think a lot more about Danny's character in particular and totemism. Not necessarily today, because I you know, but um, just in general, I think like she's so interesting because of the fact that she, like the time that she disavows them and and puts them away and how she thinks of them as her children. But then also clearly that like, she's, she's shaped by them. I don't know. It, it, there's just like, there's so much relation between her and the collective symbolism of the dragon, like as far as being a Targaryen and then also like the individual symbolism of, of the three that she hatches. Her crown has three dragon heads on it as well. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. The, the one that makes her neck hurt. I love that. And she's like, I'm going to wear this, but man, is it uncomfortable. <laughs> In as much as they try to make, uh, predict people's characters based on their sigils, Danny is a unique one. Because, you know, despite everything she's going through, um, people tend to, you know, try to compel her by referencing her dragon blood. So Jorah does this when he, or well, more like in a vision though, where he's telling her, you know, you're a dragon, dragons don't sow olive trees or whatnot. Meaning no matter what she does or no matter what she tries to do based on her experiences and her, and her understanding uh, and her desires, she will always end up just being a destroyer of things. And as much as I would have loved to neglect that fact, or that idea. Uh, recent television shows have tried to <laughs> compel us to think yeah. that no matter what Danny does and no matter her development, she will always just end up being uh, 
a, a, a destroyer. And that's depressing to think about, especially when you, you know, you followed her from book one. Mm. Uh, not depressing. It's just not a good thought to, to have. Yeah. I a mean, more I... positive spin might be that she's going to destroy unjust structures, power structures in the world and lead the way for new things to be built in their place. She might not be personally around for that, but she will destroy the bad things. Yeah. <laughs> I like this glass half full perspective. <laughs> it's, a, it's a glass yeah. half on fire, I think. Is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that her character offers a very, and, and the dragons by extension offer a very interesting um, and potentially unanswerable question about the, the relationship between creation and destruction, right? Like, is it possible to create something without destroying something else um and is there ever anything that's that's purely wholesale destruction and i think it's a particularly interesting question when you think about it um up against the white walkers and the whites right so um they seem purely non-creative right they seem purely death associated in fact that's what um that's what Mel says about them is that they're, you know, they're, they're creatures of ice and death and that's all they're good for. But, um, we have so many sort of insistent, especially tied with fire. We have lots of insistent imagery in the book about, um, that, that creation and destruction are inseparable, right? So the things that Mel says about R'hllor, a lot of what R'hllor stands for is also very destructive or very, um, cruel in a lot of ways that, that we would think about. But, um, ultimately generative, right? Like fire makes heat and light by destroying the fuel that you put into it. So I don't know. It's, it's I'm getting only it. death can pay for life. Yeah, exactly. Like there's, there's so much, it's such an insistent motif, particularly around Danny. I think of Danny is almost like maybe like the personification of that motif where like, yeah, she's, she's creation and destruction intertwined. And, and, you know, where does that leave you at the end of the day? Um. Yeah, it's uh, again, I, I don't know how intentional uh, George was. If he was, then we can predict um, as to how it, w it might end up for these characters. Maybe uh, these things are, are giving us hints as to where they might end up or just the inevitability of their uh, the inevitable end that awaits them in their current situation. Um, it's nice to think that there's meaning in the White Walkers. Um, and what they represent, and that there's something to unravel um, that a few characters in the book have, you know, kind of seen into and are trying to take active steps to stop it, like the Three-Eyed Crow or, or Rhaegar, who, you know, this, seems like this stable young guy, but all of a sudden has this awakening in his consciousness that something bad is going to happen, and, um, and you know, something needs to be done about it. So he goes to find an heir just so that they can be, um, because that's what needs to happen, um, you know, in, in, uh, to, 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 to save Westeros. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if, if we can read into it, you know, meaningfully, it would be nice to think that, uh, that we can, but I don't know if we can. I only look at the books for my interpretations for the future. To no other source material. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I think like, I think her, her dreams, her hallucinations, her visions, whatever you want to call them in the, in the Dothraki sea, um, dovetail in so many ways with her original journey through the Dothraki sea and, and all of the, um, the awakenings totemic and otherwise that happened for her there, um, that I, I'm really excited to see particularly with Danny, like what that means as far as her, her identification and, and what's in her blood and, um, and where that takes her. But, um, yeah, I, you know, like I said, I think that there's, there's a lot to look at totemically in, uh, in A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, and I think that it, you know, looking at the really sort of leaning on these symbols and the way that they're used is, um, is a, a good way to, get some different perspectives on 
on these characters and, and these books that we've been looking at for so long. Yeah. Um, I wonder how much, and uh, feel free to move on to the next topic if you wish, but um, just a question for you guys. I wonder how much um, we can, like, I, I think if Danny was not Targaryen, you know, how different would a story be? Um, how easier would it be for her to just be someone else and maybe, you know, be happy? Um, despite the fact that, you know, um, Robert and other people fear her name and are trying to kill her while she's in exile. But even when he's gone, like she could just turn away and, and do other things. But there is a strong need. And from people around her, you know, that she has to go back to Westeros. She has to have an army and conquer the thing. Um, you know, um, can't she just, you know, move to Pentos uh, and, and just relax there? Or can't she, you know, live somewhere else? But the fact that she's Targaryen and she's the dragon, she must come back to Westeros. Is that tied to the Iron Throne? Is that tied to something bigger like... Why do the Targaryens have to be in Westeros? She can st start her own dynasty elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And she has many opportunities to do that, doesn't she? Um, but she must come back. It's, you know, I don't know if, that's, if that is in line with our discussion here, but um, it's something I've wondered plenty, especially if things turn out for her the way many fear, um, if she can just be someone else, you know? I think the Targaryens are, are one of the most vexed cases or most complicated cases of nature versus nurture in these books. Um, because, I mean, they, on, a, on an immediate level, we could ask how much of her obsessive focus on Westeros and quote unquote going home um, comes from Viserys. Like if it was just instilled in her through his obsession um, because he was her only frame of reference for the world for so long as she was growing up um or whether yeah there is something in in the fact that how many hundreds of years ago Danny's the dreamer pushed them towards Westeros like whether there is kind of a, a, a Targaryen connection to Westeros that we don't know about um like, you know or or whether it's cycle more immediately psychological for her in in the things that Viserys like labored when she was growing up. But, uh, yeah, that'll be interesting to explore, I think. Um, indeed. Um, if we don't, if we don't have anything else, I did just want to do a quick shout out to the uh, Mormons. We talked a little bit about Jorah, but um, I really love the fact that the women in the Mormont family are so closely associated with the bear sigil. Um, I feel like a lot of times Cersei's, you know, self delusions notwithstanding, it's the men who take on the totemic persona and who pass on the totemic persona. But I think with um with the Bear Island women, like I think it's um is it Mage who talks about the carving that Lynes Hightower hated so much, where it's a woman wearing a bear skin and she's holding a baby in one arm and an axe in the other and <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and they, they have a reputation for like sleeping with bears and stuff, but it's just, I don't know, it's, they're an interesting case because, um, they're, they're bear women as much as they're bear men. And I don't know, I just, I, I thought that she was bears. Awesome. She bears. Yeah. I just, I, I like that a lot. And I, um, you know, Arya goes a long way sort of on an individual level towards reclaiming that personal connection with her house sigil. But, um, I, I get the feeling at least from, the glimpses that we have into their, um, their structure that for the Mormons, it's, it's an intrinsic part of that clan identity that it is, it does apply equally to the bears and to the she bears, which I think is very cool. So I just want to mention that. Um, um, can, are the Mormons, they, they're first men as well, right? They're not Andals, are they? Cause Jorah keeps getting referred to as the Andal, but I think it's just because he's in uh, Essos, they call him an Andal. But he, like the northern, it's not just the Starks, they're the, the uh, first men, the northerners, right? Basically, everyone but the Mandalese. Like, there's probably been some intermarrying, like the, the current generation of the Starks, but yes, they're predominantly first men. Okay, all right, cool. I, I was just thinking about their, the possibility that the, the Northmen, their blood, 
is more um, has any more magical properties than the rest of Westeros because they're descended from people who could warg and who had these historic, you know, magical abilities. So maybe that's that's why the Mormons are. Maybe it's some of that. Maybe that explains some of their um, their their association with the bear and why they're rep. Um, they have a reputation of being skin changers, maybe. I was just thinking. Oh, I wonder. I wonder if they... Yeah, I wonder if Were they... Were once skin changers, or maybe still are. Yeah. Be cool. Or they just live in an island that's got lots of bears on it. So, you, kinda, <laughs> you know? It's called Bear that. Island. Yeah, no, that's true. I wonder if the Skagosi uh, skin changed their unicorns. That'd be cool. Yeah. I hope. I really hope we see Skagos. I'm... I'm down for some skagosi i'll bet i'll bet you a million dollars we are going to see skagos yeah yeah like <laughs> like unicorn. Of unicorn if we're not going to see them in person yeah 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 we've, we've got to go there for something i mean rickon's going to become king in the north so that's king obvious <laughs> king in the north only if he comes in riding shaggy dog will i find that a satisfactory ending and then i will be a hundred percent on board <laughs> The feral wolves of Winterfell. <laughs> I, you know, it's about time. I, you know, they're all they're entirely so. too civilized I'm up there. to go wreck for those guys. Yeah. <laughs> Serpentine, Rickon. Serpentine. Um. All right. Well, I think that's all I have. Um. So, does anybody else have anything? Any projects coming up? Anything that they want to mention before we sign off? So we've got more rereads coming as usual. Um, there's a lot of stuff coming out, a lot of uh, podcasts that we're still trying to get done, but um, maybe something for season two of Mindhunter, uh, Netflix show The Boys. Um, we've got more like show-specific episodes that we're working on covering um, the Faith storyline, how the show handled that and what the books might do. Um, as well as uh, the Northern Houses outside of the Starks, because the, that was quite a bit different than what we expect will happen in the books. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff coming. Cool. All right. Michael, Wilson, any, anything um, else? I'm a follower. Other people make projects, and I just join on. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. That's what I do. I was going to ask um, if you had a theme in mind for uh, future parts of this series, Seminar of Ice and Fire. Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, there are a couple others that I have in mind. Um, one thing might be uh, Rene Girard's Reciprocal Violence. Um, and I, I want to look at that in terms of the Red Wedding and the Car Starks and see um, how the impulse to vengeance and the resemblance between enemies might um, change our perspective on those two events if we look at them together. Um, we might also look at um, Tillich's dynamics of faith and talk about uh, Davos and his belief in Stannis and Stannis's involvement with Mel. Um, that's another fun one that we could do. But yeah, there there are a few other things that I'm playing around with. Um, as I did this time, I will post up um, a call to arms. I'll post up the reading, and hopefully we'll get together a great conversation like the one we had today. This was a lot of fun, you guys. That is awesome. Yeah, this yeah. was fun. Yeah, this was great. Mm. <laughs> Can't wait to measure my IQ. After this. <laughs> I'll Increased report by back. Two okay. lemon cakes. <laughs> Stuck. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. Well, if that is all we have, then I will say thank you to our listeners for joining us here at Vassals of Kingsgrave for this first installment of the Seminar of Ice and Fire. And thanks to my co-hosts, Wilson, Adam, and Michael for being here. And um, encourage you all to come and find us on the forums, on Facebook, on the YouTubes, on our WordPress page. Um, anywhere you think we might be lurking, we'll probably be there. And we're excited to hear your ideas so thanks again this is sarah dr blood on the forums signing off thank you very much thanks fun, guys thank Bye. you